Let it be known that at the hour of 11 15, this night, Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, and his brother, the Duke of Puno, shall arrive at the market square and then proceed with great pageantry to Buckley's yesterday well. I declare Buckley's yesterday's well, well and truly open. Let's step inside Buckley's Yesterday's World and experience a day in a bygone age when Queen Victoria ruled the British Empire. We are pleased that you have come to visit our throne room. Though temporary, it affords gracious views of the castellated gatehouse of the Abbey. You are requested to view with interest our night attire perfectly preserved from our reign, as well as other items of personal wear, particularly my chemise and silk stockings. We have also a fine bracelet of dear Albert Victor, my grandson who died so young. Notice, if you will, his crest. Observe also our royal lineage, showing our descent and ascension to the throne. Our royal and regal descendants. God give grace and favor to them. My grandmother, Mrs. Collier, she was our dressmaker, the first one. And my grandmother, her hair used to reach the ground a drag on the ground. And old Queen Victoria heard all about this, and she made my grandmother take her hair down in the shower. <laughs> but she wasn't very pleased either. She used to have it in a bun, you know, around here. Stephen Tutt, a local resident, has many other vivid memories of his childhood. You know, when I was about eight years old, before I was eight years old ex exactly, I used to work in the grocer's shop. Hour before I went to school and an hour after school. All day Saturday, about eight or nine hours. About three hours Sunday morning. And Sunday afternoon, I used to get a cup of tea and a piece of cake. Oh, that was good. For that, I used to get one and threepence. Perhaps I only get 12 pennies, but sometimes I always get one and threepence. That was 15 pennies. And don't forget, there was 240 pence in a pound in them days. Yeah, she used to get me weighing up the sugar. The sugar used to come in big bags in a canvas bag, more like a wheat bag. About a hundredweight or a half, I expected, or a hundredweight of sugar in them. I used to have to weigh it up in these blue packets, put a pound in some of them, half a pound in the other. The thing was, the half pound used to go in the pound bags. The poor old soul, they only got half a pound of sugar bag in all. The cube sugar, they used to come in big boxes. He used to call it Titan Little Sugar Boxes. The boys used to love them, get these boxes and make lovely trucks. Mm. And the fathers used to look for rabbit hutches. And some poor old soul in our row, she was so poor she had one, she used to turn it up on its end, put two newspapers on it and use it as a table for dinner. Hmm. This grocery shop, I used to like to get an old of an oxo, put it in a cup, some hot water, some stale bread. That used to be a meal of the day, you know, in them days. The grocer stocked a wide variety of goods, including these beautiful novelty biscuit tins. Many items were sold loose, like tea, sugar, cheese, and butter, which had to be patted and weighed for every customer's requirements. Mm. 
broken biscuits were also available. After the errand boy had been employed for a year, he was allowed as a treat a broken biscuit from the threepenny a pound tin instead of the twopenny a pound tin. A really special treat was an enormous sticky gobstopper which seemed to last forever. After work, the boys rushed to play with their hoops. The bigger and thicker the iron hoops, the better the hoop was. If you got the biggest iron hoop in the school, the best one you were it. You used to have a skid to make them go along. Now and again, perhaps you'd bash into the nearest wall. And the poor old hoop would get broken where it had been joined up. So what we used to do, we used to go down old Trowel's Forge. If you'd only got a penny, you'd charge a penny for a it, but if you got tuppence, you had to pay tuppence, you know? Hmm? Now and again, the old lady in the shop would give me a drink out of a bottle. It's one, probably one she couldn't sell. It's one of them bottles with a marble in the top. You know, you have to push down before you can drink it. Ah, that was all right. Could always take bottle and all of them. When nobody looking, I used to smash the bottle to get the marble out. Yeah, <laughs> used to love playing marbles, you know? <laughs> then I used to chop all the firewood, the four wooden bobbins. You know, put a bit of string in it twice, a bit of binder twice, right? Tied as tight as you could, and to get them tighter, you just get a few pieces and drive them down with a hammer like that in the winter to make them go really tight. They were tuppence and thruppence in the shop. The groceries had to be delivered by bicycle to the kitchens of the well-to-do houses, where a large staff worked long hours for very low pay. Get that cleaning finished, cos I need you to give a hand with this stew. Well, I'm so tired I had to start an hour early this morning, all cos Mr Finch demanded his jug out water at five o'clock. Well, it's Mr Finch's responsibility to browse his lordship, and you know the master had to go up to London. He scolded me cos I was two minutes late. He should try washing in cold water like I do. Oh, stop your moaning, girl. You're lucky to have a job at all. You're getting slovenly, you are. And when did you last blacklead that range? Look at it. <laughs> Blackleading the iron cooking range in the early morning was just one of the many duties of household staff. All cooking was done on the range using cast iron pots and kettles. When making tea, the teapot was warmed with boiling water before measuring out the loose tea, which was stored in a special tinned lined box to make sure it stayed fresh. The box was kept locked by the housekeeper. The cook had to feed all the family and all the staff without the aid of pre-packed foods from a freezer. Labour-saving gadgets were always being invented. They included the Kent's patent knife cleaner. It was filled with abrasive powder. The knives inserted and the handle rotated making the leather straps inside the drum polish the steel blades of the ivory-handled knives until they shone. Another remarkable invention was the early version of the vacuum cleaner. Completely made powered, this amazing machine must have given many a servant backache. Of course, luxuries like this could not be afforded in the poorer homes. Washing had to be done in a tin bath. You know that same old bath used to have to order washing for a week? Mm. Used to dig all out in the garden, a shallow hole like that. Put two old bed irons over it like that. You know what the old bed irons that come off the bed, don't you? Stand the old bath on it. Three or four bells of water, perhaps four bells of water in it. Pack it a rinse in it, stir it up. Put it clothes in, soak it all night. Mm. Next morning, come out, we'd load a fire underneath there with old bits of wood, logs, and we'd hit. But, Boil it all up, didn't we? And when it began to boil, of course, when I was a boy, we used to have this here plunger, we used to plunge it up and down on this here. Get all the dirt out of it, you know. Yeah. Three quarters of that, I'd had enough. 
And he, he's taken his bit boy bit out the bar, put an old pal and rinsed. Only a cold water, you know, wrung out and put on the line. Well, that bar, that washing was for the whole week for the family, you know. You didn't have a shirt every day in them days, a clean shirt, no. Damn lucky if you got one once a week. You know some poor old soul down the road there up in New South Wales lay in bed Sunday mornings so she could wash his shirt so she could go down the pub in the afternoon with a clean shirt. Because he'd only got the one shirt, you see. Hmm. When the mangle had squeezed out most of the water, the clothes went off to the washing line in the garden. Monday was wash day, so the ironing was done on Tuesday. Pairs of flat irons, or sad irons, were heated on the range for use on the stiffly starched linen. The charcoal iron opened at the top to be filled with hot coals from the fire. I wonder if the clothes stayed as clean as the rinso had made them. Finally, the clothes were aired on the clothes horse in front of the fire, before being carefully stored in large linen baskets. If stored for any length of time, mothballs would be included, adding their distinctive smell to everything around. Many of the housekeeping polishes and powders were purchased at the ironmonger's, and Aladdin's cave. Behind the shopkeeper, a stack of drawers concealed a vast collection of small wares such as nuts and bolts, screws, pipe fittings, hinges. The walls were covered with every conceivable type of tool, and even the ceiling was used for display. tired of black lidding the grate with zebra grate polish, then you might be tempted to buy the very latest in electric cookers. No need to worry about fire with hardened style fire grenades filled with chemicals. Many houses relied on paraffin or gas for heating and lighting. When electricity was first introduced, everyone was curious to see the effect. As well as light bulbs, this shop sold radio valves for the latest invention of wireless. Did I tell you about our old radio? First old radio we had. Who said beyond 2LO, London, 2LO, London. Go. We used to have two great big poles outside, about 60 foot apart, about 25 foot away, with a couple of wire coming right down, right down to come down to the window, and then come through the window, and then there's an old aerial switch. So if you had a thunderstorm outside, you could switch it off, in case the aerial got hit with lightning. And here we did lighten one day. We got the aerial switched over, but that didn't stop it. It jumped over the aerial switch and blew it to blazes. Do you know what that thing cost us? It cost us four pound. That radio. Ooh, we couldn't buy another one, that was it. This portable set was the same model as His Royal Highness Edward VIII and Mrs. Simpson took on their picnics. For the Victorian parlour, the cylinder phonograph was a must. The wax cylinder was played by a permanent sapphire needle. Victorian society was entranced to hear all their favourite musical artists at home. was succeeded by the gramophone with changeable needles and flat breakable records which revolved 78 times a minute provided you had turned the handle sufficiently
The Victorian fascination for new invention was further increased by the discovery of photography. Oh, oh very still now, madam. The first photographic process was announced as far back as 1839. The original cameras were wooden boxes using coated metal plates for the photographic image. The plated bellows camera came into use in the late 1850s. The handheld camera, a smaller version of the bellows box camera, became popular towards the end of the 1870s, but it was still necessary to use a darkroom to change the plates, which were now glass. In 1888, an American George Eastman brought out a camera which was sold ready loaded with a roll of paper-backed film. When exposed, the whole camera had to be returned to the factory for processing and reloading. The camera was called Kodak. A development of this camera with a removable roll of film was the cheap and popular Brownie. After the First World War, the German firm of Lights marketed a folding camera using 35mm film, which was copied by the British company Ensign. The Ensign camera on display was used in the 1930s by a sports photographer for the Eastbourne Gazette. And smile, please. The firm of Judges, the foremost postcard manufacturer, was started in Hastings in 1902 and soon opened ten branches all over the country. Holidays, however, were still the privilege of the rich. The poor were more concerned about repairing their shoes, a job very often undertaken by the father of the family, before resorting to paying the cobbler. money was really short, then regular visits to the pawnbroker would have to be made. I became a pawnbroker's assistant in 1908, at the age of 14, with a salary of seven shillings and sixpence a week. That's less than 38p. The duties included guarding the shop at night, so I had to sleep under the counter. <laughs> but I had that homemade alarm bell you can see to your left in case of intruders, and see those triple pens on the desk at the front? They were used for each transaction or pledge. One copy for the records, one for the customer, and one attached to the item pledged. A bed sheet, for example, was valued at one shilling and sixpence, and the customer would pay a penny for the ticket, then night nip a week for every two shillings borrowed. We had scores of poor people every Monday morning bringing in their Sunday best clothes and even their bed linen, still damp from washing, and they're redeeming it on payday. That's if they could afford to. And you know, if the pledges weren't redeemed after a year and seven days, the pawnbroker was allowed by law to sell the items at auction. A strict disciplinarian made this beautifully decorated birthday card for his ageing mother in 1907 and gave it to her as a token of his affection. Christmas and birthday cards became popular in the Victorian times as were other forms of love tokens. One of the children's favourite shops must have been the chocolate shop, where the shelves were packed tight by jars of aniseed twist, boxes of nougat, and tins of Sharp's Nut Super Cream Toffee. Licorice boot laces and sherbet lemons while distracted by the pecking chicken. A quarter of Dolly mixtures, please. They sold beautifully decorated Easter eggs, too, and handmade chocolates. A tin was sent to the soldiers in the trenches, who would choose between chocolate and tobacco. John Player, king of the tobacco barons, started in business as a small seed merchant. The 
farmers would call at his store for supplies, and they asked him to get some tobacco in stock. At first, he sold the tobacco loose, weighing it into twists of paper when they called. As this was usually in the dinner hour, he found it difficult to cope with the rush. So he decided to pack the tobacco beforehand. He wrapped the tobacco individually for each farmer with their preferred brand. In this way, he could hand the goods over the counter in double quick time and serve more customers. He then decided to put his own name on the packets. The vast empire of John Player was born. Many of the other brand names here have long since disappeared, taken over by the Imperial Tobacco Company. Toy shop windows like these must have brought a sparkle to many children's eyes. The delicate china dolls were usually made in Germany. Little girls played with replicas of the kitchen in which their servants worked for such long hours. Boys had marbles, toy cars. lead soldiers, which could be mended with the aid of a lighted match. Just across the road from the toy shop was the chemist, with a cure for all manner of ills. The pharmacist mixed the prescriptions with a pestle and mortar making pills, pastes, and liquids. The front part of the shop also sold patent medicines to cover every eventuality. In those days, there was no National Health Service. Doctors and hospitals were expensive, so people tried to cure themselves with mixed success. Dental and optical treatment was also available, but rather basic. The dentist's drill was foot-operated by a series of cogs and wheels. Sterilisation was unknown, and babies' bottles and teats were used unsterilised and caused endless suffering and death by gastroenteritis. In the larger houses, the children and their nannies occupied a separate floor, only seeing their parents at certain times. They had their own day room for lessons with their governess. Perhaps when they had finished with the three hours, reading, writing and arithmetic, they'd be allowed to visit the travelling fair. And if it rained, then the playroom at home was well equipped with plenty of toys.
they included this magnificent doll's house, a perfect miniature replica of a house at the turn of the century. Every room furnished in great detail. It once belonged to a little girl called Emily. Cook is busy preparing the dinner for which the best silver has been laid in the dining room. Mother and father are listening to the gramophone in the parlour. Upstairs, baby is asleep, while the governess organises the playroom and the children have their baths. finished, the children would retire to their bedrooms. <laughs> On cold nights, the maid would fetch a heated brick from the range to warm the beds. Other methods included the copper warming pan and a stone jar of hot water, the forerunner to today's hot water bottles. Another trip to the kitchen and up the attic stairs to her bedroom for sleep at the end of a long day. taught how to sew, so that she could not only make her own clothes, but carry out repairs and alterations. Even silk stockings would be darned to prolong their use for as long as possible. She obviously wants to look her best, and wishes that she could afford a visit to the hairdressers. Vera Young set up her ladies' salon in County Durham after a three-year premier apprenticeship, which included shaving lather off an inflated balloon. If the balloon burst, you failed the examination. She often permed her sister's hair, who said it felt like sitting in the electric chair to have a Eugene wave. It took four hours to be undertaken, so only two customers per day could be given appointments. If the customer was left too long after the first steam appeared, the curls of hair would break off at the point of singe and drop on the floor. One had to keep very still after being wired up, or else it pulled the hair or burnt the scalp or neck. If the customer was under the permanent wave machine when the siren sounded during the war, they had to stay put. Many customers wanted their hair to look like the film stars of the day. The stars of stage and screen had their wigs made by Stanley Hall, who treasured his friendships with Greta Garbo, Marlena Dietrich, Vivian Lee, and Elizabeth Taylor. Cinemas were open all over the country, but a trip to the West End by train was a real treat. There were frequent steam train services, even in quite rural areas, run by four independent companies, namely the Great Western, London North Eastern, London Midland and Scottish, and Southern Railway, until nationalisation took place in 1948. Uh, we run along in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Back from
from our journey into the past, let's step through the level crossing gates into the Buds of May refreshment area. Where we can relax on the terrace overlooking the beautiful Sussex countryside. We can also sample a delicious Sussex cream tea. Complete with homemade scones. Here we find Annette and Bram Buckley relaxing briefly and no doubt reminiscing how yesterday's world started as a collection over 20 years ago. When they kept a news agents, Annette started collecting bygones as a hobby, while Bram was away on the golf course. Her first window display and their news agents won a good housekeeping prize, a holiday to Thailand. The collection grew until the Buckley's Museum of Shops was first opened in 1983. That also proved too small and today the museum at Battle has tripled in size to become a fascinating collection to enthrall young and old alike. Buckley's Yesterday's World. shop sells nostalgic gifts, such as advertising tins and enamel signs and greetings cards. There is a lovely selection of Victorian-style china face dolls, as well as everybody's favourite, the teddy bear. This charming 600-year-old Wealdon Hall house was built for Richard Curtis, the accountant at Battle Abbey, the gatehouse of which still stands just across the road from Buckley's. The abbey was built by William the Conqueror to commemorate his victory over King Harold at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, fought on this site, where legend has it that Harold was killed by an arrow in his right eye. This delightful market town was built around the abbey and still offers the visitor a welcome combination of architecture and character throughout the ages. We will say goodbye to beautiful battle and Buckley's yesterday's world to return again another day.